Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we will be talking <laughs> about Enola Holmes, but we're not going to get too deep into Enola, into that film. We're not going to sort of spoil anything, but we're going to use it sort of as a test case to talk about the larger problem with Netflix movies and sort of the formulaic, algorithmic-driven way that they are created. And so Enola Holmes, what's important to know about Enola Holmes is that it was not created within the Netflix system. It was created by Legendary, and it was originally intended to be released by Warner Brothers. And then the pandemic happened, everything got scrambled, and it decided, and I guess Warner Brothers decided, hey, this is probably a better fit for Netflix and Legendary Agreed. And that's how it ended up there. And the film is great. I, I think Enola Holmes is just, it's very charming. It's witty. It has its own personality. Uh, it makes great use of its cast. Millie Bobby Brown shows that she can easily carry her own film. And I think that was sort of, I don't want to say it was in question, but like Stranger Things, I feel like is a more of an ensemble piece. And like she had been in, got, in the latest Godzilla film, but that again is an ensemble piece. This film really belongs to her. She is a producer on it. And I think it works. I think it really highlights her charisma and uh, I think it has a great uh, supporting cast, but it really is her show. And it's, it's delightful. It's a delightful sort of PG adventure film. I really loved it. I, I think, you know, and I was a little surprised uh, cause I had been told that it was kind of aimed towards like preteens and kids, which I guess it kind of is a little bit. It is until she and Burn Gorman start fighting. <laughs> yeah. and it becomes PG 13. Some really intense action scenes. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, it's it's based on a, a series of books. I think they're children's books, not young adult books, though, they, though I may be wrong. Um, but it's based on a series of books. And I I mean, we've seen a ton of Sherlock Holmes stories before. Um, obviously, like the one that's ingrained in most people's minds recently is the, the Benedict Cumberbatch, Martin Freeman TV series iteration. Um, although I guess there's still the Robert Downey Jr. Jude Law thing. But I never I was never a huge fan of those films. Um, they always felt like they were kind of trying to mimic some other style or something. Um, but I digress. I think Enola Holmes is is a really fresh spin on that kind of Sherlock Holmes thing, uh, not only because it's, you know, the sister is at front and center of it, um, but I don't, like, there, there's just a really great energy to it, and it's also, like, about things. It's not just kind of this frivolous, like, mystery where you're just solving cases and that's that. The cases are entwined with the thematic uh, meat of the story, which is... Uh, an unabashedly feminist tale. I mean, it's a period piece, um, and Enola Millie Bobby Brown's character has essentially been raised alone by her mother, played by Helena Bonham Carter, and she wakes up one day to find that her mother is gone. Um, but through, and it's clear from the big beginning of the film, through her investigation, she learns that her mother may be involved in some form of protest against, um, or in favor of a reformation vote that's going through um, politically at the time. Um, and the the Reformation vote would would expand uh, the rights for women. And so it's really, I mean, a lot of the film is about a woman in a man's world. And I think that's reflected in Enola's relationship with her brothers, um, Mycroft and Sherlock. Mycroft played by Sam Claflin, who's kind of the dick of the family, <laughs> I guess I would say. Uh, and then Sherlock played by Henry Cavill, who's a bit softer, um, but is still pretty patronizing to, to en Enola. You know, she should kind of know her place. She's a child and she's a woman. Um, and she's also, you know, trying to be forced into finishing school to go and marry a man. And that's kind of her path that's set, set out for her. But I think, you know, the, the film does a really great job of weaving those themes in organically. Like it doesn't ever feel like it's dumping you over the head with message with a capital M. Um, and that's kind of one of its charms because it, it works on the surface tremendously well. Like it's super fun and super entertaining. And Millie Bobby Brown is incredibly charming. Um, but then it, you know, it's about something. And and those themes are baked organically into the plot of the mysteries that she's trying to solve. Um, and I think Harry Bradbeer does a terrific job directing. He directed Fleabag and won the Emmy for that. Um, and there's some direct address stuff in here that I think works really well. But yeah, I was kind of floored. Like it, it just works super well. Yeah, it's it's effervescent. It, it really, I love the way it sort of turns conventions on its head. Um, very consciously show, so like there is sort of, a romantic 
quasi romantic angle. It's not like the the forefront, but basically yeah. like there's a young lord that she has to help, and it he's very positioned, very much positioned as like the damsel in distress. Yeah, and so for her to sort of save him is very sweet, um, and very well done, and, and it's just it's it, it no it has a very it's very conscious of the way it 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 message is centered but in a way that like you said never feels like it's beating you over the head it's it's a very fun film to watch and i feel like the the personality of it is something that you don't really see in netflix films before we should go further let me say when we talk about netflix movies i want to sort of break them into two camps there are the Netflix prestige movies that get to be their own thing. And those come at the end of the year. And it's like, if Martin Scorsese wants to make a four, make a, you know, three hour, four hour gangster film about aging, we're going to let Marty do it. And, and Godspeed Martin Scorsese. That's sort of the prestige is in its own little basket. And those are sort of to get Netflix in the awards race and to sort of say, we do prestige content. We want these high profile creators here to draw people in so that if you want to see the new David Fincher movie, you have to subscribe to Netflix. Like that's the deal. That's part of it. Those are, those, those, but those are, those are the minority on the other side is everything else. And that's a little trickier. And that's sort of where you get these kind of formulaic films. And, and to be fair, studios have always tried to aim for the formulaic. I mean, if you're a studio head, the way you keep your job and the way you sort of appease your board and appease your shareholders is I made it like the other thing. Like you, and so even if it fails, I made it like the other thing. So, you know, when, if Batman begins comes out and Batman begins as a hit, everyone's like, let's do a gritty reboot in the vein of Batman begins. Cause if, if everything fails, Hey, Batman begins was a modest success and it made sense at the time. So we'll do that. I mean, and you can sort of see these sort of storytelling tropes kind of reappear. There was that period where every script had to have like the villain be captured. It was part, it was part of, there was actually this thing, it was like a book called Save the Cat, uh, which is sort of this, like, this is how these things are written. And so studios look for the formulaic. The twist that Netflix sort of throws in the mix is that they're also want it to be formulaic, but for them, they have an algorithm and data that says, okay, we see that X, Y, and Z are performing well, make a movie that does X, Y, and Z. So it's not even like a studio. It's not, it's no longer a person saying, make it like the other thing. It is an algorithm saying, make it like the other thing. And it leads to a lot of really forgettable. And in a weird way, kind of like almost, I'm trying to think it's, it's one thing to make a formulaic film. It's weird to make a formulaic film that feels so, driven by data that it lacks a personality and that's what sort of what you see with netflix movies yeah although i would say i guess i would say the majority with the caveat that like a lot of these movies you and i have not seen mm. because i could also point out examples that don't fit into the prestige like not they're not the irishman or marriage story um but they're also not um like those adam sandler movies so there's stuff like Mute, like Duncan Jones's Mute is just like incredibly weird and incredibly strange. Uh, like Mike Flanagan's Gerald's Game is very like mm -hmm. a contained horror thriller. It's very strange. Um, even the Laundromat, like I don't think they thought it was an Oscar movie. That I, I think there was just a case of like giving Steven Soderbergh. Sure, yeah. There's people everything. that they, yeah. There's definitely like we want to be in business with this person and like Netflix, um, you know. I don't want to say they never offer notes because they do. I mean, we have evidence of that with like extraction. Like they're like, you should change the ending of extraction. And we wrote an article about like, let's make this nicer. <laughs> yeah. You softer. Know? And even in the opening of extraction, like I clocked this the first time I watched that movie where it opens with that kind of unnecessary flash forward to Chris Hemsworth. And I was like, this is a weird way to start this movie. It's a trope. Like it, it's not, not that it's like strange and out of the ordinary, but just like, this is kind of boring. Um, and then I realized the first 20 minutes of the movie are spent with the kid. And so I am sure that Netflix, or I think actually Jeruso said, like Netflix told them, like, you guys probably want to put Chris Hemsworth at the beginning to promise people that he's showing up at some point because <laughs> they clicked on hit play because of Chris Hemsworth. Um, and even, I mean, Kerry Fukunaga talked about this with his TV show Maniac. He said Netflix would give him data that said, like, we've shown that if this kind of thing doesn't happen by episode three, people are unlikely to finish the series. And he said it was very helpful. Um, 
And I do think this kind of data can be helpful in, in kind of helping guide. But I think our, our larger point is, you know, a lot of these Netflix movies that we've been. So I, and I guess we also need to talk about the first blush, like the first rush of Netflix movies, because a lot of those first ones were acquisitions. So like Beasts mm. of the Southern, or not Beasts of Southern World, Beasts Beast of, of No Nation was acquired, uh, I think, from Sundance, Sundance or TIFF, um, one of those two places. Uh, and something like Set It Up, I think, was produced independently. It was not. Uh, it was a romantic comedy that I don't think was produced in house by Netflix. But then the, the success of movies like Set It Up created more formulaic romantic comedies after the fact. Mm -hmm. So like I really enjoy Always Be My Maybe, but it kind of you can feel a little about a little bit of that formula kind of poking through. Yes. Um, and even you know. I don't know about Eurovision. Like, I really love Eurovision. I didn't necessarily feel like it, that one was formulaic, but I'm sure the algorithm had something to do with the way it was structured and stuff. Um, you know, something like Let It Snow, another, you know, YA rom-com. You're seeing a lot of movies that are very similar to one another, not only in, like, the kind of tone of the movie, but, like, literally the structure or the kind of music that's in the movie or, you know, just the way that it's playing out. Right. And then they're sort of like, and it's not that they're they're all bad. I mean, also we should note that like, I'm looking at a list of like Netflix originals right now. And, and we're not really talking about like, here's this film we found from Brazil that we're going to do, you know, like there's a lot of foreign acquisitions. Well, that's um, the other X factor that we also should like at least mention is that, you know, a lot of these movies are not made for cinephiles. They are not made for, you know, American audiences who are super mm -hmm. into David Fincher and Martin Scorsese. Right. Their algorithm is telling them that a lot of people are liking these kinds of films. And a lot of films that show up in the top 10 are international films. There's like Brazilian thrillers in there, um, you know, some French and German films. So their Netflix is increasingly international in the original content that it's creating. Because I do feel like they are starting to feel like, um, I mean, I'm sure their numbers are showing they've hit a somewhat of a cap in America, at least. Uh, right. And so they can expand in those markets by creating. So some of these original films are not made for us, but something like Coffee and Kareem, which, you know, is presumably like a cop buddy comedy with Ed Helms mm -hmm. and Taraji P. Henson. Uh, that's the kind of movie that feels very formulaic and yeah. kind of just kind of like shoved off. Yeah, same with like Spencer Confidential. Like, yeah. yeah, I know I've seen Peter Berg, Mark Wahlberg team ups before. And like, I'm not saying there are any great shakes, but Spencer Confidential definitely feels like this has to go here, this has to go here, this has to go here because people watch, you know, they're going to get like, you have to, you have to win them over in the first 10 minutes. There's no time for like a slow build. And so you need like a quick action scene there. And then you need like this, this, and this. And it just sort of, it, it, it homogenizes its own content and it's sort of like, it's sort of the flip side of what Netflix is trying to do, which we've talked about before, which is that Netflix isn't really, Netflix is in this awkward dance between being a studio and being a tech company. And as a studio, they're like, okay, well we like, what's going to be popular? What's going to appeal to the widest audience, you know, but they're not driven by box office numbers. So it, it doesn't quite work that way. As a tech company, the idea is to disrupt and to use, you know, to basically throw as much money at the, the service as possible to force out competitors and make Netflix like the one-stop shop for streaming content. And so Netflix, like Netflix started out, um, I saw a funny joke the other day where it was an old person being like, Netflix used to come in the mail. And they're like, that's nice, Grandma. And it's like, no, it didn't used to come in the mail. <laughs> um, and then when it streaming started out, they were like all into these licensing deals. And like, I, I, I think, I forget. But anyway, they, they're all these licensing deals. And then they're like, oh, these licensing deals are going to run out or get super expensive. Let's just make our own content. And so well, it was also because the studios that held those licenses realized how key it was to Netflix mm -hmm. surviving that they started yeah. upping their prices. Exactly. Well, and not just that, but then these these they wanted to create their own streaming services. Yeah, Why yeah. give it away? So Netflix had to move into original programming. Um, and but the idea for Netflix is to like be your one stop shop. And I think you know is was you know your your fiance works with the youth at her job and isn't. The, don't one of some things they ask is like, is this on Netflix? Like when you're talking, yeah. you know, it's, it's like, kind of like if it's not streaming, it doesn't exist. Exactly. Like it doesn't it doesn't occur to them to like go on Apple TV and see if they can rent it or, um, you know, God forbid, even just like blind buy a Blu-ray or anything like that. 
most of them don't have Blu-ray players. Most of them don't have cable. So it's kind of like if it's on one of the one to three streaming services that I own, I'll watch it. But if it's not, I haven't seen it. Yeah, then then it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and so and that's like for Netflix, like they're OK with that, obviously. Um, but like they want to just keep cranking out content and it doesn't really matter if the content is good as much as as much as it matters that the content cover the widest swath available of being like, well, we have romantic comedies, maybe we have serious dramas and we have action movies. And we have, the, you know, it's just like, it's like, what if Blockbuster was the channel, <laughs> yeah. you know, but, but only Blockbuster created the movies as well. It didn't actually have to work with other studios or things like that. And that's sort of the Netflix philosophy. And of <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a funny anecdote that I think really illuminates that is, is my fiance told me, uh, she was talking to a lot of the kids uh, that she works with. They're like between like 19 and like 21. Um, and they know Eddie Murphy from the Haunted Mansion and that's it. Like they have not seen Beverly Hills Cop. They like maybe they've seen Daddy Daycare. But like, you know, when you and I were growing up, we could go to Blockbuster and rent Beverly Hills Cop and learn like, oh, this is like where he started. And like, this is very funny. Um, or like go through a back battle. Like when you were curious, you could go and rent what you wanted to see, or you just watch it on cable. Like Indiana Jones plays on the Paramount network all the time. Um, but the, the, the issue is people, you know, if they don't have cable and I get the cable super expensive, um, and Indiana Jones is streaming on Netflix. So I guess that's a bad example, but like a lot of these older films are just not being watched. And so people's kind of perception of who these actors are or like they're what they're famous for is very different. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, there are certain things that just kind of fly over the heads of, of younger viewers, because if it's not available, it just doesn't get on their radar unless like they are like raised in a home that like put a, put a, um, put a premium on that. Like, so for instance, I remember when I was, I had just gotten out of college and I was, I was to make some extra money. I was, um, or to make any money, I was working as a substitute teacher and I was talking to these kids about movies and they just had never heard of the Godfather. Yeah. Just hadn't heard of it. And, it, and like at the time I was kind of aghast, but then like, you know, looking back on it, I was like, of course, why would you have heard of the Godfather? If it's not streaming anywhere, if it's not available anywhere, like, yeah, it's one of the biggest films of all time. But at the same time, that's sort of like saying like, have you heard of, you know, if I mentioned like the Canterbury tales, like, which is one of the most important books of all time, but maybe you haven't heard of it. You know, it's sort of like yeah. that. Yeah. And it's tough. And I think, you know, that also drives a lot of these Netflix original films like they, you know, Enola Holmes was very uh, attractive to them because it started Millie Bobby Brown. They already have a built in audience of uh, Billy Bobby Brown friends who like Stranger Things. It's kind of why Palm Springs going to Hulu made a lot of sense because Hulu for the longest time was like the only home for Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, you know, got a ton of streaming numbers there. Um, therefore, their audience really likes and knows Andy Samberg. Um, so the, it's also kind of dictating the kinds of actors they're willing to kind of place at the forefront of, of a lot of these films. Um, though obviously there are, you know, other examples like Set It Up. I don't think... Uh, you know, I can't imagine Zoe Deutsch and, and Glenn Powell were like huge names for Netflix at the time. No, no. I mean, for I think for set, up, set it up, it was just sort of this low risk, low like high reward yeah. kind of. Yeah, you know, I think it performed better than they even expected. Yeah, for sure. But but again, that also speaks to the fact that like Netflix is also a black box. Um, we can't see how well anything performs, and that's why I'm always like I'm always immediately dismissive when Netflix is like hops on Twitter and is like, this made 78 million viewers on the first day. And I'm like, well, okay, but that's relative to what? <laughs> Tell us about your failures and then we'll start, I'll start caring about your successes. Yeah, the best way to know what's doing well on Netflix is really just to see what they're making. So like Space Force, uh, you know, funneling a ton of money into Space Force made a lot of sense because clearly the office is huge there. But even like, you know, the swath of romantic comedies in all shapes and sizes that came after Set It Up, tell you that set it up did tremendously well on the streaming yeah. service and i'm sure like we're probably like i would not be surprised if extraction did well but like i mean i think it probably did very well and i wouldn't be surprised if we saw like a bunch of like you know take a movie star drop them in a foreign setting and have them beat up you know people yeah gritty action or starring you know this guy you like yeah or a girl you like i mean the old guard i mean even though the old guard came out the same year so it clearly wasn't greenlit like because of extraction uh kind of fits that bill a little yes. bit 
Yeah, no, it's a globe trotting. I mean, you know, the Gold Guard kind of reminded me of like, what if Six Underground, but not garbage? <laughs> <laughs> and I have not seen, I have heard enough terrible stories of Six Underground to not watch Six Underground. <laughs> right. Well, and I, I think, you know, again, Netflix is sort of like, they have to sort of start green lighting stuff to get the data that they need. So, and in order, like without data, they sort of fly blind and that's how you get something like Bright, where it's yeah. like, oh, it's a blockbuster. <laughs> it's a yeah. high concept blockbuster. And it's not like anyone was talking about Bright. But it's no. like it fit the it it it's like okay we can get Will Smith and we'll what we'll more with David Ayer who was pretty who was much hotter at the time and you know it's a script by this unproblematic writer named Max Landis so what, what can go wrong there and th let's just you know make it a holiday you know it'll be our holiday blockbuster. Well, and also uh, you know. A counter example, or I guess maybe a similar example to that, I think is interesting, is the Cloverfield Paradox, mm. which they acquired from Paramount. It was a huge deal. I mean, a lot of people watched it after the Super Bowl. You had to, you had to watch and review it that same night because they didn't announce that they had the nope. Cloverfield Paradox until during the Super Bowl. And Matt was like, "I guess I'm staying up to watch and review this tonight." Um, but like, they never like we have not seen a further Cloverfield type movie from Netflix since then. So that either means that a you know bad robot and JJ Abrams are unwilling to you know uh, I don't know further sully the Cloverfield brand or do anything like that, or it just didn't do super well. Because um, we haven't even seen a bunch of uh, like I I kind of expected more Stranger Things type movies. I mean we've seen a lot of Stranger Things type shows from Netflix, and none of them seem to have really hit that well. Um, gosh, what was uh, well, they just canceled. I am not okay with this, which I think got pretty okay reviews. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. So yeah, I mean, I, I was actually expecting Netflix to pick up Paper Girls, which is a light, which is it's based on a it's a series of graphic novels that like Stranger Things, but not terrible. And in yeah. turn, it's actually Amazon picked it up. So um, there you go. <laughs> or Bird Box, you know. Oh, uh, Bird, uh, Bird Box <laughs> is such a piece of fucking garbage. But Bird Box actually, I think, speaks to like what a Netflix movie kind of looks like in the sense that, like, oh, look, every Netflix movie has to start in medias res. It has yeah. to start with the dramatic stuff happening, and then we'll cut back and be like, how did we get here? And then it's just, and then it's kind of cheap. It's like let's put a bunch of actors in a house and like, you know. God, I, I hated Bird Box. I saw that in a theater. <laughs> they showed that to us in a theater, and I was like, I want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but even going back to, like, the release the same year as Bird Box was Velvet Buzzsaw, which is one of the weirdest movies you and I, I think, I've ever seen at Sunday. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and High Flying Bird, which is, you know, not super, well, I guess it could have been super commercial, but it didn't seem like that one hit really well or, well, or really, I, like, exploded. And that's sort of the other thing. It's sort of like, I think, you know, they do have these great movies like High Flying Bird, but because, again, Netflix is like content, 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 they don't promote a movie in the same way that a, a regular studio would. Like a regular yeah. studio is like, we only have, you know, 10 to 12 movies a year. And so we are going to like come up with a very specific strategy. We're going to like, you know, like if we if we were to release this movie, High Flying Bird, we'd get a buy in. For, like maybe we'd like show promos during the, the NBA finals or, we, you know, we'd, we'd make, you know, we'd reach out to this audience. We'd we'd market it here, here and here. And Netflix is like, here's a trailer. It comes out in three weeks. <laughs> comes on out in two days. On to the next. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I remember, I think it was David Fincher giving interviews for the first season of Mindhunter where he was talking about, you know, the discussions were where they were kind of like, you know, this is not going to be some big opening weekend. And that's what we're headed towards. They were like, you know, this is a thing that is supposed to live and exist. And, you know, there will be a longer, I guess, longer trajectory. Of well, the, yeah, the long tail. Yeah. So, I mean, I think ultimately their goal is they want you to finish a show like, um, Oh gosh, I don't know. Say you're watching like Law and Order and you've finished binging that entire series. They want you at the end, they want it to say, we recommend Mindhunter, which is something they own that already exists on there. And they want you to go and watch that because it's like that thing that you liked. So I think a lot of it is just kind of like this this circuitous uh, kind of like to keep you engaged and keep you involved. Um, but I mean, we also can't ignore like they're still making really good like Defy Bloods is one of the best movies of the year. And that movie is not formulaic in the least bit. Uh, you yeah, know, I again, can't like that. there's again, there's two pockets there. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's 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 the sort of the formulaic mass consumption, you know, content 
and then there is the the prestige. I and... think the frustration on my part comes from the fact that it, I feel like the the more formulaic stuff deserves to be better. Like even something like Spencer Confidential, like, like I've enjoyed a Peter Berg movie in my life. Like I know that he's capable of making better or more entertaining films. And it, you know, it, I feel like we wouldn't be um, uh, kind of ragging on Netflix if there weren't that, that potential there. Like we, it feels like, and, and that track record of like this formulaic thing has happened so often that it feels like it is a thing that is going on. Right. Uh, well, see, my concern is that, you know, Ben Affleck spoke to this recently about he thinks that sort of the more adult dramas that he likes to make are just going to have to live on streaming, that they're not yeah. going to go into theaters. And the thing is, is when you make that sort of 40 million adult drama, the studio typically doesn't bother you because you're not costing them a lot of money. Um, and they're like their notes just aren't going to be they're not they can't make they don't make notes in the same way that they're going to make for like a 200 million dollar movie. That yeah. says, you know, you need more action here, or that you need more jokes here. It's just like, this is a drama. It plays for this. It gets this on return. Let's move on. It's basically like they're more concerned about what's going to hit a home run than what's going to hit a single. And eventually they're just like, we don't give a shit about singles. Take it to streaming. The problem is, is when you take that to streaming, then streaming is actually like, no, no, no. Our algorithm says do X, Y, and Z. So your adult drama ceases to be as adult as it could be. So that 40 million, like, so something like The Way Back is like, hey, this is good, but maybe we could like start it with like a flashback of like his glory, you know, or like him at his lowest and then we'll cut back. And then like, you know, maybe, you know, our viewers really like it at, at the 30 minute mark when this happened. So can it be like that? And like, the problem is, is like, if you're the, if you're the creator of The Way Back, you know, if, you know, you, you don't, where else are you going to go? Yeah. If the studios are making your movies. So if we're saying that Netflix and streamers are your now the home for this kind of movie, we don't want the movies being made in this fashion. That's sort of my argument. Yeah. Like I think something like the town, which I think is a really good film, I think could be really mucked up and become a really forgettable formulaic thing. Um, if it had, if it had gone through that kind of algorithmic notes process and that, you know, I remember Matt Damon saying like that script was around for a long time and he had passed on it. And even in its script form, it was very formulaic and dull. And then he asked Ben Affleck why he was interested in it. And Ben Affleck said, no, here's what you do. You do this, this, and this, and that makes it a lot better. And he said, Matt Damon said it was like a light bulb turn on. Like Ben Affleck was able to kind of see this formulaic script and make it something that was interesting and more engaging, more emotionally involved, uh, more resonant. And I feel like that, that more formulaic version is more often the, the kind of, the version of that kind of film that gets pushed through, unless you have the level of like, if you're at the level of like Spike Lee or Noah Baumbach or uh, even Charlie Kaufman, it feels like, you know, they're not going to bother you really. Like they're yeah, going to let gonna, you make your movie. Yeah. They're not going to bother you. And also I do, although that being said, I do think that's sometimes a double-edged sword. I mean, yes. you, you brought up mute mute needs notes. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird film, but it's also yeah. a film that's really uneven and it feels like it's not where it needs to be um to achieve what it's setting out to do and so i don't think like i'm not someone like you know i think studio notes rightfully have gotten a bad rap <laughs> because a lot of studio ideas are are pushing you towards a safer direction but yeah. sometimes it's just good to have feedback and be like here's what we think take it or leave it but when you're when you're netflix and be like go do whatever you need here's money yeah you know because because for us it's just content we don't give a shit it's on to the next um, we have no investment beyond this is product for subscribers. Um, you know, then the I think sometimes the film suffers, you know, and go sometimes do whatever you need is how we get the Hobbit trilogy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> go do you is, is exactly, <laughs> you know, I, you know, and so I feel like, you know, that you need sometimes need that process. Um and so I feel like with Netflix films, like the reason like Enola Holmes is an outlier is it just feels like a film that's that's kind of fresh and imaginative. And when I say fresh and imaginative, when I'm, you know, fresh and imaginative and populist, because I think that's that's sort of the thing. Because when we're talking about the prestige films, like it's you and I are be like, yeah, we'll totally watch Marriage Story. A lot of people do not <laughs> want to watch Marriage Story. They just don't. <laughs> they, just, yeah. they think it's going to bum them the fuck out. And we're like, <laughs> no, it's actually really good. But they're like, no, it's going to bum me out. 
Enola Holmes is a populist play. The problem is, is like those populist plays that Netflix does are usually kind of sanded down. All the rough edges have been sort of sanded off because the algorithm says to do such and such. Yeah. And Enola Holmes is notable because it doesn't have, it has like its own spark and its own personality. And I think that it's the, it's better for it. Yeah, and I think a, another good example of that is The Old Guard, which I, I know you and I both liked a lot. I know some people didn't like it as much as Extraction, but I feel like The Old Guard is more interesting mm. uh, and more emotionally engaging um, than maybe a more formulaic version of that movie could have been. Right, and I think part of The Old Guard's success is that Greg Rucka got to adapt his own yeah. book. Um, and so he knew you know, the strengths to play to in that adaptation rather than like, what if we had created this from scratch? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting what happens with Netflix, especially as they start competing with like Netflix hasn't really had to compete for a long time. They were just sort of able to coast. And now it's like Disney has a streamer. HBO Max is out there. Like what are and what are these other streamers going to do? Like, I think something that I'm worried about with like, let's say HBO Max is I think they are creating content that is in their attempt to sort of offer a lot. They're not being as uh, precise. So I am on episode six of The Vow. I have watched six episodes of The Vow and I'm like, why is this nine episodes? <laughs> and I feel like it's nine episodes, like in the way that like McMillions was six episodes. It's like, it doesn't need to be, but like people want to like watch these long documentary series, let's make them longer. And so it's just like a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I also understand full well the irony of us uh, dinging Netflix original film in the year in which they have probably the best shot of actually winning a Best Picture Oscar now. <laughs> um, yes. Because the playing field is so, uh, le not level, but low, just because so many theatrical releases have been pushed to 2021. Um, and that eligibility window has been pushed a bit, so yeah, I feel like something pretty big recently got, is getting like an early 2021 release. which Cherry. Cherry, that's it. Uh, and that's Apple, so another streamer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, between Trial of Chicago 7 and Mank uh, and Defy Bloods, it feels like, uh, you know, now more than ever, Netflix really has a shot at winning Best Picture, which they really wanted with Roma, uh, which is another movie that, like, clearly was untouched by notes. Um, but you, like, I, I don't think I've convinced a single person to watch Roma. <laughs> It was hard to convince me to see time. Roma, and I was at a film festival, <laughs> and I like Alfonso Cuaron. And even I was like, this is going to be a sit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great film, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I am I, will say I'm I'm happy and grateful that they are allowing stuff like Mank and Defy Bloods and, and those kind of films continuing to exist alongside some of the others. Uh, I think you and I come at it just from a like a missed opportunity. Like, if Netflix is kind of the future now. Netflix is what it, where everyone is watching their movies. It feels like we deserve better in terms of populist entertainment. I which are more movies like Enola Holmes. Yes, I agree. I think, you know, yeah, I think you need to sort of take your foot off the gas on the algorithm says this, yeah. therefore good. But then again, maybe I'm wrong because I don't see what the numbers are. I don't know how many people watch Spencer Confidential. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't, we don't know. Like, that's the other thing. We're operating sort of, I admit our ignorance here. But again, that goes to like Netflix shouldn't take credit for their successes if they're not going to like share like their failures beyond like we canceled this show after one season. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're like, fuck you. The babysitter killer queen got more views than Mank and Roma combined. So yeah. we will continue making. I mean, those Adam Sandler stuff. films clearly must be huge because they are yeah. just, they will not stop making them. And I'm, su I'm not surprised that they're huge. No, like, uh -uh. you know, I mean, and Adam Sandler, cause Adam Sandler has always had that audience in a yeah. way. Um, even though, you know, it was notable that I think he was kind of theatrically on the decline. Yeah. Like, right then he's like, oh, let's make this Netflix deal. So, because I don't think like, I don't think like Pixels performed well. No, but he's the epitome of like, well, like get out of my house and get a babysitter and pay to go see an Adam Sandler movie. Nah, but if it's on Netflix, sure. Sure. <laughs> I'll give it, I'll give it a spin. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's where we're at with Netflix. Um, yeah. But if you haven't seen Enola Holmes, give it a watch. It's, it's really good. It's great. Um, all right. Uh, let's jump into recently watched. What have you seen lately? Uh, so I recently watched The Dead Don't Die. Uh, trying to get into a spooky season, uh, um, season, I guess. Uh, and I had not seen Jim Jarmusch's 2019 zombie movie uh, with Bill Murray and Adam Driver and Tilda Swinton, Chloe Sabigny. Uh And I was not a fan. <laughs> 
I don't know. Have you seen Dead Don't Die? No, because I'm not really a Jarmusch fan. That's the thing. Like I've yeah. seen like I, I I've sat through some of his movies, and I know people are like, oh, Down by Law, and like they just they love his shit. Um, I like Ghost Dog, but beyond that, I I I I'm not saying he's bad. It's just his wavelength is not my wavelength. So I really liked Only Lovers Left Alive. Um, and I was curious about this one because it, it seemed to be tackling some kind of like B horror movie trappings, but like where Only Lovers Left Alive is kind of a surprising Jim Jarmusch vampire movie. This is a very Jim Jarmusch zombie movie. Like it's so deadpan and lifeless. I was just really bored by a lot of it. Like there were a couple of pretty solid jokes, but like even, you know, I went after I finished it, I, I read some reviews and even the positive reviews are like, you know, there's so many good jokes that make you smile. Like it doesn't really make you laugh. <laughs> like you just kind of like, it's sensible chuckle magazine. <laughs> really? Like it's just very simple, very just extremely deadpan jokes. And it's got this meta level to it where Adam Driver's like talking about the script and Jim Jarmusch. And I'm like, what? Like, I don't think that part works very well. Um, Cause it doesn't ever really to like capitalize on it beyond just like being silly jokes. Like the beginning of the movie, there's a song on the radio called the dead don't die. And Bill Murray's like, what's this? And he's, and Adam Driver's like, it's the theme song. The dead don't die. The theme song. Because there had just been an opening credits with the theme song to the movie. Uh, but like it's just kind of like a throwaway deadpan aside that just like doesn't really return to. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I was I was not really a fan. Uh, I don't think I am a, a huge Jim Jarmusch fan. Um, but if you are, you'll probably like the Dead Don't Die. It seems like people who really like Jim Jarmusch enjoyed it. But if you're like in the mood for a really good zombie movie, I, I can't say this one delivers. Yeah. Um, for me, I recently, uh, Criterion Channel is about to lose its Western noir lineup. So I was like, I want to, want to dive into that a little bit. And I'd been meaning to watch some of the Anthony Mann, James, uh, James Stewart Westerns. And one of them is on there. It's, uh, the Naked Spur from 1953. And it's really good. It's, I, I mean, the Western noir, it's like, it's sort of, it's post-war Westerns. They're getting darker. They're getting grittier. The plot of the Naked Spur um, is that James Stewart plays a bounty hunter and he, in his quest to pick up this uh, bank robber who that is wanted for, uh, wanted dead or alive, essentially, uh, to bring him in, he ends up teaming up with this um, uh, prospector and a, uh, a, a dishonorably discharged soldier. And the quest is like, how do we bring this sort of manipulative criminal back and trying to bring him back alive. And it's, it's just, it's very, it's very well done. I like it when like for me, James Stewart, and I, I think this is the case for a lot of people, James Stewart is George Bailey. And so you see him as very warm hearted and very good and very sensible. But man, when James Stewart plays an unhinged dick, it's just, it's like it, it, the cognitive dissonance you could like bathe in it because it's like, it's not that he's playing it badly. It's just, it's not what you expect from him in your idea of uh, your platonic ideal of James Stewart. But like when you get to something like Vertigo or a film like The Naked Spur, it just, it really kind of rocks you. Um, and he's very good in this. And I thought like Anthony Mann did a great job directing it. Um, and it's just, it's that, I mean, we've all seen that kind of plot where it's like, we had to bring this criminal back, but the criminal is kind of like trying to turn us against each other and make us escape. And like that gets picked up in a lot of action movies, but here it's done, it's done very well. And, um, just a really good classic film. Um, and I'm trying to make more use of my Criterion channel subscription and I'm definitely going to be making use of it in October because there's going to be a ton of seventies horror films on there. Uh, in October, so uh, I'm going to be diving into that. But The Naked Spur is, is very well done, uh, so I'd say check that one out. That's kind of why The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance is one of my favorite Westerns, because Jimmy Stewart gets to play kind of like a complicated character. I mean, yeah. he's kind of the stand-in for the good guy, quote-unquote, but that movie is all about upending the Western tropes. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, with Liberty Valance, it's sort of like he goes in thinking he's one thing and, and, and leaves being another. Like, all yeah. the sort of the change happens with him, and, um, you know, John Wayne's character is sort of the the reality. You know, he's sort of the external force that presses on what James Stewart thinks he can make up of the West. Yeah, yeah. Liberty Balance is, is awesome. So good. Um, so, yeah. All right, so I'm about to post a poll for what we're going to be discussing next week. It's going to run for a day. Uh, these films are going to be streaming on Netflix. Uh, 
And the choices are Enemy at the Gates, which I've never seen, Fargo, uh, Troy, which I think we're going to dive into the director's cut <laughs> as well. Um, and then Boys in the Band, which arrives on September 30th. Um, so I am going to post that. Go, please go vote and you will determine what we discuss on next week's episode. Choose uh, wisely. Please choose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you want to keep up with this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chipman. You can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.